Welcome to Cryo Talk, a bite sized bio podcast sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific, featuring conversations between your host, Ava Amson, and experts in the field of cryo electron microscopy. Today on Cryo Talk, we're joined by Joachim Frank, Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics and of Biological Sciences at Columbia University, as we discuss his Nobel Prize winning discoveries. It was a very uh, instant glimpse that this could be used in, in image processing. His second career as a fiction writer. Well, it's a novel about a, a scientist, of course. Why he loves living in the Berkshires. So they're very interesting people from all fields of, of, of science and arts. And the importance of always using your peripheral vision. You, you just don't know what opportunities come along. All in this episode of CryoTalk. Hello, I'm Ava Amson, and I'm here today with biophysicist Joachim Frank, professor at Columbia University and recipient of the 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work on the early development of cryo-EM. We are going to talk a bit more about that later. Um, but first, Dr. Frank, how are you today? Fine, fine. Thanks, thanks very much for having me. We're glad to have you on the podcast. Um, can you tell us a bit about what um, you're currently working on or what your group is currently working on? Um, well, uh, there are um, a number of time-resolved cryo-EM projects. Um, and uh, this time we are working on uh, eukaryotic translation, uh, different steps in eukaryotic, uh, eukaryotic uh, translation. Uh, previously, we worked on uh, E. coli uh, translation. And uh, so this is a major switch. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds uh, really interesting to really figure out all the, the mechanisms behind it. And um, as I mentioned, you, you got a Nobel Prize a few years ago for work that you did many years ago in the um, early development of cryo-EM, and, and that work was in the, the pre-cryo-EM days. So can you tell us a little bit about how that connects to um, what, what now people know as cryo-EM? Well, um, <clears throat> this, was, uh, this was very interesting and exciting um, a pioneering time when uh, we had to make do uh, without um, a, a very, very good um, means of supporting uh, molecules. So we used a negative stain and negative staining is, is really an, an, not, not a very good method to preserve 3D structure. And so um, it, it, it was a great challenge from, from that point of view. Um, and uh, so, uh, nevertheless, we uh, essentially we, we got it done. Um, the trick is, I think, uh, with negative stain that you uh, <clears throat> you choose sections where you get a, a full coverage with the stain, so that you can get at least the preservation of the, of the entire structure. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's distorted, it is always distorted. It's always collapsed in the yeah. in the Z direction. So it's a it's it's a lot easier now to image than it was for you back in the days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and uh, so this 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 is <clears throat> actually that's a major challenge in in with the whole idea of single particles because um, since they are not the molecules are not setting to, uh, sitting together. Mm -hmm. uh, they cannot, um, they, they're not sort of fully stained normally. Yeah. So each, each molecule is individually stained and, and each uh, has its own way of getting stained, you know? So, so there's a lot of variability. Mm. And that, that actually was interesting because that variability um, uh, was... Uh, <clears throat> was interesting from the point of view of, of, of looking at, at the multivariate statistical uh, aspect of it. <clears throat> so it, it's possible, uh, you know, at the time when we developed the multivariate statistical analysis, which, which was 1980, 1981, um, 
uh, the, the the first the first really very dominant thing that came came out when we looked at um, uh, molecules in stain is is a very big variability in stain distribution at the periphery. Mm. So <clears throat> so you get you get some um, uh, you get molecules on one side that that are uh, that are only um, you know halfway uh, in the in the puddle, and the other ones are are completely immersed. Wow, <laughs> that's a very that's a very interesting aspect of of uh, heterogeneity. Yeah, yeah. So and 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 your your work from around that time was very much about like being able, I guess, to average the image and, and get a sharper picture? Is, am I summarizing that in a way that makes sense? <laughs> well, the the, the two-dimensional uh, proof of, of, of getting uh, getting much enhanced uh, two-dimensional information mm -hmm. was, was sort of the first proof of concept. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so the, uh, the proof was uh, to get uh, successful alignment of, of, of images. And then, um, uh, yeah, that was essentially the first thing. Uh, we, we could get sharper information out. Mm -hmm. But then the next step was, which was really a real milestone, is to uh, be able to differentiate between molecules that have different appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so, so then you get, you get really very sharp images of subsets. And that that was a big breakthrough. And I think, you know, in terms of of um, <clears throat> credibility of the entire method, that that really made made a very big difference. Yeah. So that happened in 1981. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's it, if you think about what people are are looking at right now, it so often really is about distinguishing the the tiniest little differences, and right. so there's a lot of information in that. Mm. Um, so over the course of your career, you've worked in uh, in Germany and the U.S. Um, can you take us very quickly through that journey? Uh, well, it was a very big, uh, very long journey. <laughs> uh, I was uh, I was first in uh, at the University of Freiburg uh, and got my uh, four diploma. Uh, so it's the bachelor, and and I majored in physics, uh, and then. I went to Munich and did a master's um, a, at a place uh, a, at the Zerollwagen uh, Institute um, where uh, I worked on a, a project of um, um, looking at the backscattering of electrons on liquid gold. Um, so uh, that was a very big experimental challenge because you had, if you can think of it, you have to keep gold uh, at a at a melting temperature uh, in a in vacuum where you also do measurements of of uh, uh, backscattering of electrons. So this uh, was an incredible experimental challenge, and then but that introduced me to electrons. And um, an electron, um, you know, I had to, to build a little electron gun in the process. So that sort of steered me in that direction. But also the, uh, the mentor that I had, uh, Dr. Kinder, um, was one of the pioneers in, in biological uh, related electron microscopy. He, he discovered the, um, <clears throat> the patterns of of butter uh, of scales on butterfly wings in mm -hmm. 1943, um, so wow. which which produce color by interference uh, effects, uh, and, and so he so he had an he had an instrument uh, an, an old electron microscope in his office uh, that looked like uh, the cannon of Peter's uh, Peter's moon uh, shot, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a children's book. Um, it was it was mounted. Uh, it was mounted 
uh, horizontally uh, slightly coming up to you to the observer so the, the screen the screen was in front of you and the, and the, and the cathode was was at the, at the very far end and how, how big was it <laughs> well it was it was an you know a normal column size mm -hmm. but, but it was it was uh, <clears throat> mounted uh, you know slightly upward mm -hmm. uh, horizontally uh, facing facing you um, <laughs> So, so then, um, since I wanted to stay in Munich, um, I, 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 had to, I had to find a place where I can, could do electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so that's how I, I wound up with uh, Hopper, Walter Hopper. Um, so Walter Hopper uh, <clears throat> had an institute uh, for uh, structural research but but he was an x-ray crystallographer who who uh, uh, discovered an interest in electron microscopy so he he applied all the different concepts of x-ray crystallography in 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 electron microscopy hmm. so so there's a lot of work that I, a lot of theoretical work that that he did at the time mm -hmm. It's very. It looks very esoteric. If you if you take a look at it, it's very very esoteric. He had he had incredibly high flying ideas, but but uh, they, they could not be realized at the time. Many of them could not be realized at the time. So that's how I spent uh, time, and and I that's where I got into image processing. Um, I uh, did the first image processing of micrographs. And um, got, um, you know, we discovered that one could use correlation functions in order to get um, alignment of, of images. And uh, I found out all, all kinds of all kinds of theorems. Uh, I, I <clears throat> studied uh, statistical optics. Um, and uh, applied some of the theorems in, in image processing. And so that was really the beginning. And in 1970, I, I, got, the, I got a PhD. And in the process, um, I, I got a nomination for a Harkness Fellowship uh, that brought me to the United States for two years. And I could select any labs that I wanted uh, to go to. And so I wound up at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory first, mm -hmm. and then I went to Bob Glaser's lab in uh, at Berkeley, and then at uh, Cornell University. Um, and a very interesting time was at the JPL, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, because at the time they had the most advanced image processing equipment in the world. Oh well. Wow. <laughs> uh, so. Um, you know, I, I could do scanning and, and also uh, making images again from the computer, you know, which nobody could do anyway. Mm. You know, we, 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 we did overprinting, overprinting of characters uh, <laughs> uh, before, before that. Wow, um, yes. <laughs> that, must, that must have been so interesting to, to be at a place that was really at the, at the forefront of technology. Yeah. Yes, and, and I... I um, <clears throat> I used uh, I used the image processing system Vicar. Uh, not I, I didn't it didn't just I didn't use it, but but rather I use it as an infrastructure to to port my my programs in. Mm -hmm. and, and so so I had an entire infrastructure which you know did uh, pseudo do loops and and th things like this. So the, I so I hook, hooked my programs up, and it was very. A very um, a very advanced kind of way of, of of using software, and then later on, later on, these ideas that I found in in the software development, I applied in the development of Spider. Has there ever been a moment um, at any point in your your research or career where things took a surprising turn for you? Always, always. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I told you about how I, how I ran into electrons and electron microscopy, yeah. and you know, 
And I, I wound up with Hoppe only because, because I wanted to stay in Munich, because mm. I thought it was an interesting uh, place to be. And, and later, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> there's a story about the multivariate statistical analysis um, that um, it, <clears throat> it, was, it was a sheer accident how, mm. how, how we uh, developed this. Um, and, you know, it was uh, spurred by uh, somebody <clears throat> working in uh, blood sample analysis and uh, bec because multivariate statistical analysis had been used for a very long time uh, for, uh, for, the, for this kind of, uh, for, for, for specimens, me medical specimens. Mm. And <clears throat> so, so they sort of, it was a very uh, instant glimpse that this could be used in, in image processing mm. and so that was very exciting. Yes, very it's, exciting it's funny how, how things end up. Like you make a you make a choice for one reason, and it ends up uh, completely yeah. defining the course of your career. <laughs> well, that, that's that's why you know there, there's a lot of I I got, got a lot of questions from from students. Uh, you know, is, is there something special that that you want to convey to us? You know, what uh, how, how how can one be successful and and then I, I always say peripheral vision, you know, keep the peripheral vision open. Uh, don't just just uh, follow some one one specific plan because you don't you you just don't know what opportunities come along. And you you just so ha have to keep a very open open mm -hmm. eye. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um... And if we go back to um, cryo-EM for a bit, um, is there anything that you're very excited about um, where the field is going at the moment? Um, well, you know, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the fact that we are now uh, coming, uh, getting something in the two angstrom range, mm -hmm. um, if, if we do things right, if the sample behaves right, uh, that that's very exciting because then really uh, cryoEM can contribute to drug development and, and so forth. It, it's really the the uh, <clears throat> uh, the right direction. And and um, I don't know what the purpose of going to one angstrom is. Uh, I mean, it, it becomes more more yeah. esoteric. Um, and then, so, the, so lately, I'm I'm really very interesting uh, interested in in the cryo in the in the time resolved uh, technology. I've contributed to it, and and I think uh, that it's it's probably gonna gonna become mainstream uh, when when the, the the kinds of instrumentation is is generally available. And so I'm working myself on on this. I'm working. In collaboration with a with a company to make that happen, mm. and you know we're trying to get into an we're trying to get into a price range where it, you know becomes competitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely exciting times, also for um yeah, I guess people will be able to use it for so many more applications. Uh, yeah, right. And then the other the other um, developments that that I. I've been involved in is is the uh, mapping the mapping of uh, conformational uh, space and mm. uh, you know state space and uh, uh, to um, <clears throat> uh, to map the uh, free energy landscape of a molecule. Mm. Wow. So that's that's an um, it's a very fascinating aspect of, of cryo-EM because you, you get such large ensembles of, of molecules. You can get millions if you want to. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, a deep data analysis and uh, <clears throat> machine learning uh, can, can give you a, a sense of the conformational variability and you can then analyze it to uh, to get free energy landscape, and from there you really you can explore um, the uh, the functional 
movements of the mm. uh, of the molecule. Yeah, wow, that's that's that sounds like something that's like thinking back to my own days of studying chemistry and biochemistry. That just seemed completely impossible, and that's the. Yeah, yeah I have a. Um, I mean, if if you want want me to just illustrate this with a few word words, uh, my my favorite example is is if you, uh, I I found a I found an image uh, it was from somewhere in China there where where. 10,000 uh, horses were galloping over, uh, uh, you know, through a landscape. And uh, of course, one couldn't see the 10,000 in this picture. It's just mm -hmm. this upset, but you could see them going into the horizon. And then just, just imagine you have somebody standing somewhere, a tourist, and he takes pictures. Um, and it takes, you know, a whole lot of pictures. Or you, in fact, you have many people standing there, and they're all taking pictures from that direction. So then, <clears throat> so then the challenge is, uh, you go home, and now you you try to sort these pictures, and they're all galloping. So so you could you you should be able to get um, for each for each horse picture that you have, there's always an before and an after one. Of, of any other horse, okay? So you can order them in the sequence of gallop. And then, so you can you can actually extract from there an entire sequence, the, the entire uh, work cycle of, of gallop uh, from, from all these horses. Mm. <clears throat> so that's, that's really what one can do um, if, if we have some you know, conformational movement of molecules, which are multidimensional, yeah. and then you can, you can order them, you can order them in, in the different dimensions, mm. and then uh, can, in the end, get, get uh, information about work cycles and so <laughs> forth. Wow, <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, so we talked a bit about um, what you see the where you see the future of the field going but um what about yourself do you have any plans for the next few years well i'm uh, i i was um <clears throat> very um lucky to get uh, to get another big grant and so i'm i'm going to i'm going to be able to uh, realize a number of my dreams uh, mm -hmm. You know, in terms of time resolved, cry AM and so forth, for the next um, the next four years, and mm -hmm. that's pretty much my sort of the milestone of, of retirement, probably. <laughs> <clears throat> so one big project before you retire, <laughs> so, yeah. and um, I I understand that you're also a novelist. Can you tell us a bit about that? <laughs> well, I've been dabbling in in. Uh, fiction writing for a very long time. Um, I, I got very excited when, when I discovered that I can really write, write English mm -hmm. uh, as a second language in a way that would be recognized. And, and you know, I, I, probably, I was able to publish short stories and so forth. And then, and then I have written a number of novels and uh, one of them is has been published uh, in in 2019, and uh, so it's available now. It's it's called Anze, mm -hmm. but it but it's really um, <clears throat> uh, I I wrote it a long time ago yeah. and and had to rewrite it very often. And uh, it's it's fun to read. I think it's an uh, it's a novel about a a scientist, of course, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it uh, it doesn't have a lot of similarities with me, <laughs> but uh, but it benefits from from the whole uh, knowledge that I have about about how science how mm -hmm. how, how the how the heads of scientists work and uh, what what makes them excited and so forth. Yeah, and and is it um, did you start writing as kind of a distraction from research or do you see um, writing fiction and thinking about science as somehow using the same creativity? Or? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, but at the same time, I, 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 would, I would 
be unable to confine my my whole being to uh, to to science. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's impossible. Uh, I, I really need need this as an I, I wouldn't call it distraction. It, it, it's rather an, a, a sort of a complement mm. of, of of my whole uh, existence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and can you tell us a little bit about the picture that's behind you at the moment? We can oh, right. <laughs> um, well, this is um, this is a picture. Um, it's a collage uh, that's supposed to look like a bu- butterfly. And uh, it was done by my, uh, it was a present by my daughter uh, when, when she was in high school. It was one mm-hmm. of the projects. She, she did really absolute be- beautiful things. She, uh, she, um, she, started, she started drawing amazing things when she, when she was little, when she was maybe eight, t- 10 years old and so on. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful things. I, I have a large collection of these. And then in high school, it became much more uh, elaborate. Mm-hmm. And then I, I, I always thought she, she, would, she would somehow get into area of art but but she didn't she got into linguistics and uh, and now she is in a code uh in a, in a <clears throat> code academy um so she is uh she is in a at a place where she um uh, you know develops curricula for code uh okay. developing so you've always like encouraged um, your children to be creative. And- oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really because <laughs> for me, for me, this is really sort of the essence of of uh, my uh, <clears throat> you know day to day existence. I I really I enjoy looking at things. I enjoy taking pictures. And bring them into contexts, in different contexts. I enjoy the juxtaposition between images and texts. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's very, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, 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 there they are essentially three ways how you can explore this. Uh, one is, is that the uh, <clears throat> the image is an illustration of the text, and the other one is that the text is a legend to the image. And the third one is is that you now you take deliberately two completely unrelated image and text together, and then you 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 find out that in the in 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 in, in the in the person who who looks at it, you immediately start getting a new gestalt from this. You 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 they are immediately seen as in some way related, and that relationship is sort of created in your brain. Mm. And, and and so this is this this kind of <clears throat> this kind of exploration is very exciting to me. <clears throat> yeah, and I guess in people don't tend to think of science as being creative, but it is of course very much related to images, especially imaging work. So. <laughs> sure. Um, I've got a few short questions for you now. It's a uh, quick fire questions, but if you want to take a bit longer about one of the answers, you can. Um, so first you, you're at Columbia University, which of course is in the middle of New York City, but do you personally prefer the city or do you prefer the countryside? <laughs> um, uh, both. I, I prefer <laughs> both. And I, I'm in a very lucky situation that I'm right now I'm in the countryside I'm uh, at a house that we have in the Berkshires Mm, and uh, so we have an apartment in New York City and uh, we have this house here and of course we spend we spend most of the time in the last two years here at the house for obvious reason (laughs) Um, and uh, but uh, but I mean, the rural environment is really, really fantastic, especially the Berkshires, uh, where you have a little bit of both because you have a lot of retired people here who are, uh, you know, maybe 60% come, come from New York City. And, and so they want to keep a, an, an intellectual 
uh, environment going. So they're very interesting people from all fields of, of, of science and arts. Wow. Um, and, uh, and in the Berkshires, they, you have Tanglewood and, and Jake, Jacob's Pillow and, and, mm -hmm. and all this. So I, you know, I, I, I love to be here, but at the same time, the urban environment uh, in New York City, this cosmo cosmopolitan mm -hmm. place is, is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's really wonderful for someone who comes from Europe and it, it, it is really uh, more European than Europe, uh, actually, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because you have, you have this cross-cultural interaction there. Yeah, yeah, and it's like its own little little universe. <laughs> yeah. mm. Um, do you like cooking at all? Do you do you prepare your own food at home? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> but I, I, I got. Um, I mean, my my wife is is such a fabulous cook uh, <laughs> that I I can't you know touch. <laughs> she it. won't let you. <laughs> no, 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 she won't let me. But but I'm I'm sort of I I I can't keep up with anything any, mm. any like this uh, so i used to just make myself spaghetti and so forth but but yeah. now but now i just um my my daughter um uh, you know just just uh, gave me very detailed instructions for for a certain dish and and uh, and so i'm i'm excited to really get into that yeah and then i watched I, I I was forced to watch some of the British uh, show, uh, and Bake Off, uh, Great British Bake Off, yeah, the, bake, the Great Bake Off. <laughs> <clears throat> so they both, my my wife and my daughter, watched it, watched every single bit of it, and and sometimes I I sort of saw it, <laughs> saw a, a part of it. It sounded like great fun. <laughs> very inspirational to, to, yeah. to see people baking things um is there any book that you have re read recently that you would recommend to people <laughs> oh uh well the book book by ishiguro is probably very widely known now uh, mm -hmm. so i really enjoyed it and uh, as as you know he he got his nobel prize in literature mm -hmm. in 2017 so i i got to know him oh did well, you meet him in Sweden? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that was really fabulous to, oh. to see him there. And what about music? Do you listen to music? Yeah, uh, I am really, um, I'm very fond of classical music and, and we, we've we been to concerts very often in, in New York City. Um, and then, but but I'm very much a reggae f a fan. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, reggae is uh, is so much on my mind that uh, on uh, for my fiftieth birthday, they uh, they, um, they did a surprise party which was all reggae uh, on on the reggae and, and, and Jamaican theme. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I, I love asking people this. If you were not a scientist, what do you think you would be? <laughs> like any other career? Well, I, I would I would really be an artist and, and, and writer. Um, mm -hmm. I think I never contemplated this kind of career because I thought it it's not going to be, mm -hmm. um, you know, only only a few people really make it, and, and the other ones don't don't really have a very very good existence and be, besides this my my father uh, he, he had had a very um negative um attitude toward toward artists um he he thought he they were sort of parasitic on the yes. society <laughs> well now you kind of have both careers in a way because you managed uh, to <laughs> to get your novels out um, we're, we're coming to the end of um, our episode, but, and we, you already mentioned this earlier, actually, when we were talking, but my final question to you was, do you have any advice for researchers who are just starting out? <coughs> their well, there's the thing about peripheral vision that mm -hmm. I already um, uh, talked about. Uh, there are things that are coming up from the wayside, and then you have to not treat them as, as uh 
uh, disturbances, but but rather as opportunities to, uh, you know, look at, at at other things. You know, open yourself to to other uh, influences, uh, and uh, and then the other one is um, that uh, my personal experience with the mentorship in Walter Hoppe's uh, 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 place was that that. I really I developed ideas uh, <clears throat> not under his guidance, but in opposition to his guidance. Uh, that, so there were a number of things where I thought uh, I was confronted with opinions that I thought were, were untenable. And, and, and so, so I give him credit for this. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, in, in this environment, I, 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 was, um, I was able to be creative. Uh, because of of the uh, things that I had to contend with, so so the advice is then uh, that if you have some some really uh, some ideas that that you really believe very strongly in, then uh, don't let yourself be talked out of it. Yeah, that's good advice. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Frank. Um, that brings us to the end of this episode. And thank you, everyone, for listening to or watching this very first episode of CryoTalk. Until next time. Thank you for listening to CryoTalk, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash CryoTalk.